This is CBC Here and Now. Forget what you read about NAFTA and the negotiations and Twitter wars. That's not who we are. Sure, it's business and it's important. But Gander is the place that, in a snapshot, illustrates the Canada-US relationship. Central Newfoundland played a big part in the aftermath of 9-11. The U.S. ambassador is marking the anniversary in Appleton. Coming up, one year after the roadside death of a fellow officer, police are upping the pressure on drivers to move over when they see emergency vehicles. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. Let's get started. Ceremonies were held all across the globe today to mark the anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks. A town near Gander got a special visit from the American ambassador. Kelly Kraft made her first official visit to the province today and chose to speak at Appleton's annual ceremony. Here and now's Garrett Berry was there. These bells marking 17 years since the attacks on 9-11, when they found themselves in times of trouble. As a child, I spent a lot of time at the airport, and we would watch all of the passengers come in, because the international section at that time was open to the public. I felt that day at Gander Academy, it was like being in the airport again, seeing all the people from around the world coming in to visit. It was very emotional from that report. A volunteer all those years ago, she was busy when thousands of stranded passengers stopped in Gander. Today, listening to other stories. Uh, I was at my desk for both impacts across the street from the One World Trade Center. Um, and thankfully got out before the collapse, uh, thanks to my sister. She calls herself a survivor. It's her third visit to Newfoundland, a visit that helps her to heal. Because September 11th, as you can imagine, is difficult in New York. It's difficult and I'm not saying it's not difficult here but it's so uplifting here. Organizers say today's ceremony is to remember the victims and celebrate the volunteers. In her remarks the ambassador says that's what we need to remember. Gander will go down in history as being the place that embodies the meaning of friendship and humanity. In her remarks, the ambassador told the crowd to forget what they had heard about NAFTA, Twitter, and the politics of the day. She said this story, the story of central Newfoundland and 9-11, encapsulates the American-Canadian relationship. But politics can't stay on the sidelines forever. Really nice stories, and it really puts a sense of why it's important, and it really brings it back to the individuals. And then, you know, we might be 10 minutes later talking about, you know, tariffs on aluminum and steel and the forestry industry and, and the dairy industry, as an example. So it's what we do. The ambassador headed back to Washington today. Ball says he hopes she takes some great Newfoundland memories with her and into the NAFTA negotiations. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Appleton. And coming up in 35 minutes, we'll look back at how people in other parts of Newfoundland and Labrador played a role in the days following the 9-11 attacks. We'll take you to St. John's, where churches, schools and arenas became makeshift hotels for hundreds of people. And in Stephenville, where plane after plane landed in the fog. And to Happy Valley Goose Bay, where local residents and the military community stepped in to make sure everyone was fed and had a place to sleep. In the United States now, where the World Trade Towers once stood, at the Pentagon, and at the edge of a field in Pennsylvania, people gathered today to remember those killed in the 9-11 attacks. They read aloud the names of loved ones and spoke about their courage. And they pleaded for greater sensitivity to how they should be remembered. Stop. Please, stop using the bones and ashes of our loved ones as props in your political theater. Their lives, sacrifices, and death are worth so much more. It hurts. To my mom and to all of you and your loved ones, never forget. Garnet Ace Bailey. Sharon M. Falcom. Juan Ortega Campos. David Ortiz. A piece of America's heart is buried on these grounds.
In total, 2,977 people were killed in the Al-Qaeda orchestrated attacks 17 years ago today. The victims range in age from 2 to 85. Well, back in this province now, we have a clearer picture tonight of how the Muskrat Falls public inquiry will look. Massive amounts of documents and dozens and dozens of witnesses all looking at a hydroelectric project that nearly doubled its original price tag and is being described by the Premier as the province's most glaring fiscal mistake. Terry Roberts will be part of the CBC team covering the inquiry and joins us now live in the newsroom with some details on what we can expect. Terry? Oh, yes, Carolyn. It all starts on uh, Monday in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Two weeks of uh, public hearings right on the doorstep of that controversial Muskrat Falls project. The first phase of the inquiry will focus on the period before Muskrat Falls was officially sanctioned in late 2012. The first witnesses will look at the history of cost overruns on mega projects, the history of the Churchill River, and the river's links to Aboriginal groups in Quebec and Labrador. Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall will be among the first to testify, and accounting firm Grant Thornton is expected to release a forensic and investigative audit of the decision to, uh, to sanction Muskrat Falls. Now, amazingly, the inquiry says it has received 2.5 million documents coming from sources such as the provincial government, uh, our, our, our energy corporation, Nalcor, big players like SNC-Lavalin, and one of the main contractors, Astaldi Canada. The parties have been very cooperative in uh, providing us with uh, documents. It's a big undertaking, and uh, we would certainly not be able to start the inquiry when we are starting, that is next week if uh, any of the parties had, uh, had uh, put up roadblocks. Uh, now, most of the hearings will be held right here in St. John's with the first phase wrapping up uh, sometime in December. Now, uh, phase two will start in February. That's going to look at, uh, you know, what the cost estimates were originally for this project and try and answer the question, get to the answer as to why the price has nearly doubled, why, the, why such a delay in the timelines. So you can expect some very revealing testimony and documentation, but not everything is going to be made public. Transparency is one of the guiding principles that the Commissioner has given us to work with. It's not the only guiding principle. Uh, transparency in this case is going to have to be balanced with some of the competing interests, chief among them being commercial sensitivity. The Commissioner has been very clear right from the start that he's not going to put anything out there that could hurt the financial position of the province. Uh, damage, do damage to any of the parties in the, any other, uh, in any of their contractual relationships or anything like that. Now you can expect more than uh, 100 witnesses uh, over about 100 uh, hearing days to appear before Commissioner Richard LeBlanc, including some big names, uh, you know, Danny Williams, uh, Kathy Dunderdale, Ed Martin, and including our current Premier, uh, Danny Williams. Now hearings will continue until next August with a final report from Commissioner LeBlanc on December 31st, 2019. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts in St. John's. We've noticed over the years that there's a lot of snowmobilers in the area and there's, and there's a lot of talk about ATV traffic coming into Cornerbrook, so we thought that there would be a, a market there for us. Well, these chalets in the middle of Cornerbrook's industrial park may just change the way we look at tourism in this city. Well, a fast and heavy dose of rain will be pushing across the island overnight tonight through to tomorrow evening. Some areas looking at between 20 and 40 millimeters of rain with the potential for some downpours that could affect driving conditions. I'll have all the details coming up. It's been one year since an RCMP officer was struck and killed while helping change a tire on a New Brunswick highway. Now police in this province are doubling down on efforts to get drivers to slow down and shift lanes all in the name of safety. Here and now's Andrew Sampson reports. The death of RCMP Constable Frank Tashanians made headlines one year ago. A leading force in establishing move over laws in Nova Scotia, his death underscored their importance. 140 on the outside lane, SUV, white SUV. But police in this province say drivers still aren't listening. Unfortunately, even though this legislation has been out for some time, we're still seeing on a day-to-day -day basis that people are not moving over, pulling over to the next available lane when our workers are out conducting traffic enforcement. 
And that's a worry for police, who want you to know the deadly consequences of not obeying the law. Today, this traffic stop exercise on the Trans-Canada Highway in St. John's was a show and tell to direct drivers on what to do when they come across an emergency vehicle on the side of the road. Motorists must now on our highways slow down 30 kilometers per hour or more below the posted speed limit, as well as, if practicable and safe, move over to a, the other lane of travel and uh, pass safely by, uh, create as much distance as what they can between themselves and the emergency vehicles as they're passing by. Some passers-by knew to change lanes and slow down, others stayed in the same lane and kept speeding along. We're still seeing people uh, you know, totally disregarding uh, speed limits and traveling at extremely high rates of speed. Um, you know, so far today, our officers have uh, issued almost 50 tickets. Increased efforts to enforce move over laws are all about one thing, making sure that the next time an emergency vehicle stops on the side of the road, nobody is hurt or killed in the process. Andrew Sampson, CBC News, St. John's. Now you heard Constable Higdon talk about some of the ticket numbers. Now we do have the totals. The RNC and RCMP handed out 77 tickets on that stretch of the Trans-Canada Highway just outside of St. John's. 41 for speeding and 28 for violations of the move over law and eight tickets for other offenses. Well, the province will not be taking another look into the 2008 death of an inmate at Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Last week, Austin Aylward told Here and Now that an investigation into his son's death was all a show designed to make the government of the day look good. Put on the, on the back burner on the shelf. It was just to appease the public and my family at the same time. Uh, I don't believe right from the beginning there was any intent to do anything about it. Austin Aylward Jr. died of a seizure in his cell of March in March of 2008. He was serving a sentence for a break and enter in his hometown of Clarenville. There have been four other inmate deaths in the province in the past year, but because the investigation into Aylward's death was done by the previous PC government, the justice minister says he can't speak about it. I can't put myself in Mr. Aylward's position. I mean, the last that he suffered, I would only be able to express my condolences. That being said, I, I can't, you know, comment on what was done before my time and whether something was done or not done. All I can deal with is what presents itself while I'm here in this position. And what I would say to that is that we've hired some very competent people to run an investigation. I don't take this lightly. This is not something that sits well with me. How do you turn an industrial park into a tourist destination? Well, Cornerbrook is trying to figure that out. A part of the town that's typically home to car repair shops and surplus furniture stores is getting a makeover. Here and Now's Colleen Connors has more from Lundrigan Drive. Crews rush to get the roof and framing on five small cabins in one large rental unit. This is the future home of Appalachian Trails and RV Park. We're on the outskirts of Cornerbrook, so we're kind of remote, but we're actually in the city of Cornerbrook. have all the amenities of Cornerbrook. If you want to go in to do some shopping, you can do that. If you want to do another restaurant, you can do that as well. You can barbecue at your, at your chalet. You, you basically have choice. The 30 acres of land once housed a family two park and water park, and soon the land will be a camping facility with cabin rentals and RV parking. But why cabins in the city? Uh, we've noticed over the years that there's a lot of snowmobilers in the area and there's, and there's a lot of talk about ATV traffic coming into Cornerbrook, so we thought, thought that there would be a, a, a market there for us. Kendall is partnering with Rugged Edge, a store that specializes in snowmobile and ATV sales and rentals. So the cabin link is a great idea. Um, again, when you're on the back road here now, you wouldn't know that you're right on the outside of a city. The industrial park is the gateway to snowmobile trails, and most riders use this route to connect. There's hundreds of snowmills that bypass here because anyone that leaves from Cornerbrook drive up past the Green Tank, which is, is right around London Drive. Borden believes the industrial park could be a huge hub for tourists looking to visit Cornerbrook. We constantly get calls from people that are in Gross Morn and have a day to kill before they get back to the boat and uh, don't know a whole lot they can do in between. We, you know, we, got, we give them suggestions on th things to do, but it will be nice to have people come to Cornerbrook for a day and spend some money and get around. The hope is this place will attract tourists who want the cabin feel with the city amenities. Well, these brand new cabins and chalets should be completed by the end of the fall, which means that all those snowmobilers can rent and stay here come this winter. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. 
This is the ship that sucked up oil out of the Manola Cell. More details on the now completed cleanup operation that's coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's a bookend to a story that's been five years in the making. Oil is no longer leaking into Notre Dame Bay. The Coast Guard has completed its cleanup of the Manolis L and says the shipwreck won't cause problems again. Here by live with more. So Katie, what were crews doing in St. John's today? Well, they were offloading this. Crews are still tallying exactly how much oil they were able to retrieve off the Manola cell, but this is some of it. We're very happy with the outcome and we're confident that the risk of a uh, significant release of pollution from the Manola cell has been eliminated. The Manola cell could have been carrying up to 600,000 litres of oil on board when it sank in 1985. The Coast Guard says some got out when the ship went down and more started leaking five years ago after a big storm. Between 115 and 150,000 liters were left on board in 2016 when the Coast Guard did a survey, and today, officials said not much is left behind. Very, very little, just residual that is impossible to remove from uh, a wreck at that depth, but uh, the bulk oil has been, we're confident that the bulk oil has been completely removed. What's left? is sealed inside the ship. 
The Coast Guard will continue to monitor things, but the big cleanup is complete. Incident Commander Miller says it's one of the Coast Guard's biggest undertakings yet. This is not the largest amount of oil that has been recovered, but this is the first of this type of operation that was completed. So the oil removal from a wreck at this depth and these temperatures and not using divers, using ROVs. And from what I understand from the salvage experts, this is a first for the salvage industry as well. Two months and millions of dollars. But like the exact amount of oil recovered, cost is still being added up. Contracts and preliminary Coast Guard figures put the operation at about $23 million since 2016, a price the Coast Guard says is well worth it. The safety of life at sea and protection of the marine environment are two of the Canadian Coast Guard's priorities. And we've known for a while, as, as the Canadian, the Newfoundland public, that that was a concern and a risk. We're very happy that it's over. So what happens to the oil? Well, it won't be thrown out. According to the company that's processing it, waste oil goes for about 30 cents a litre. So apply that to how much they're expecting to get from a Manola cell, and that could be $45,000. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. Now, before we get to the weather, we have a video from Labrador that we want to show you. So that's the Terrington Basin Boat Launch in Happy Valley Goose Bay. It looks beautiful, mm -hmm. but if you look closely there off in the distance, you can see two pickup trucks and a loader are stuck in the muck. The men who own them say the plan was to go off-roading, but water levels rose so quickly and they became stuck. And then the loader that was supposed to rescue them also got stuck. So they were still working out a plan to get the vehicles out as late as this afternoon. Mm -hmm. We wish them good luck. Yes. That's an expensive problem to have. <laughs> well, you know, if they want to go off-roading tomorrow, Happy Valley Goose Bay is really the place to be in the province tomorrow. They the only place that at, won't be raining? <laughs> yeah, they're looking at a gorgeous day. It'll be like a, a back to summer in Happy Valley Goose Bay tomorrow. Uh, I'll have all those details in just a second, but uh, we're going to start with some current temperatures in the province. Still not looking too bad in the mid to upper teens on the island. Happy Valley Goose Bay right now is sitting at 18 degrees, so we do do have a system that will be pushing through the island tonight uh, into tomorrow, bringing lots of rain. We have a special weather statement in effect for the Gross Morn area, Green Bay, White Bay, right along the West Coast and the South Coast, Buren and the Avalon Peninsula. All those places will get the heaviest rainfall. We're looking at between 20 and 40 millimeters of rain, and that rain is going to be heavy rain. It's going to be fast rain, so we're looking at some downpour potential tomorrow. So this is the system you can see Tuesday 9 o'clock here we are midnight 1 o'clock so by 4 5 a.m. That's when the heaviest rain is going to be affecting the west coast. So if you're in Corner Brook and uh, we're in Port of Basque, that's when you'll be seeing the heavy rain tomorrow morning and tonight looking at about 10 to 20 millimeters of rain affecting the west coast about two to four uh, for the Grand Falls Windsor area and Gander could see uh, the start of that rain uh, overnight tonight and St. Anthony looking at two to four millimeters there, but uh, for the east and Buren looking at a mostly clear night tonight, won't see any of that rainfall until tomorrow and right across Labrador, clear skies. So tomorrow morning, if you're in the east, this is what you're going to see, a mainly cloudy day to start and it won't be later in the day until you get home from uh, school where you'll be seeing that heavier rain start, kind of the reverse uh, situation for the west coast, the heavy rain to start the day and then clearing by the afternoon. And if you're in Labrador looking at a cool start to the day, but temperatures really bumping up in the afternoon. So looking pretty good for Labrador. So tomorrow this is how the system is going to play out. By the time we get to 11 a.m. That's when central areas Gander should start seeing that heavier rain, that yellow portion right here. That's going to be where the downpour potential will be. And by the time we get to around Around three o'clock. That's when, uh, you know, Buren, St. John's, Avalon will really start to see some of that rainfall. Now, St. John's won't be getting as much rain as, say, the southern Avalon. So we're looking at five to ten millimeters of rain for St. John's for tomorrow during the day, and then another five to ten in the night. So it's going to continue raining into the evening hours. But the southern Avalon looking at a heavier rainfall, ten to twenty millimeters there. Harbor Breton looking at getting the bulk of it tomorrow, all in one shot 
that 20 to 40 millimeters forecast for the Harbor Breton area. And as you head up to the northeast coast, looking at about 5 to 10 millimeters of, there, of rain there and temperatures in the upper teens for the west coast. Another 10 to 20 millimeters of rain coming for uh, Corner Brook, Stephenville and Humber Valley, as well as the Bay Vert uh, Peninsula. There are 20 degrees as the high as you get to the straits, though, things start to clear off quite nicely. Two to four millimeters for St. Anthony and Port Schwab, but Labrador just have a look at this 24 degrees and sunshine in Happy Valley Goose Bay tomorrow. So that's why it's going to be the place to be tomorrow. Uh, Lab City not too shabby as well at 21 degrees. So lots of sunshine for everyone to enjoy. That's your forecast. Jeremy, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. Three Cape Breton fishermen are safe and sound tonight, and it's all thanks to a crew aboard the Marine Atlantic Ferry who rescued the men after their fishing boat caught on fire. Gary Mansfield reports. Good to be alive. The captain and two crew members from Wakoma First Nation are happy to be on dry land today after their vessel caught fire last night while fishing for redfish about 50 nautical miles from Glace Bay. My biggest fear has always been a fire. I don't like fire on a boat. It's a, <laughs> you know, it's your, there's no fire department, nowhere to call or anything too. As the boat burned, the crew threw the life raft into the water, but it got caught on the bow of the boat and they couldn't get in. So the three men locked arms and jumped into the ocean wearing their survival suits. Hopefully that shark don't get us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. As the three were bobbing on top of the water, they watched the boat burn and the stars overhead. Christian Phillips says he was worried about sharks and his family. Before I left, I, I hugged my family because you never know, right? And I called them before we left. Said I loved them and I'll see them when I get back. Didn't expect that. Good to be back, I guess. And that, I don't know, first time ever for me for a boat fire. I don't know. What's don't going know. through your mind? Just hopefully a boat comes soon. The three men were in the water for about an hour and a half before they were plucked from the sea by a Marine Atlantic ferry crew. It was fully uh, on fire. So when we got closer, then we see the, like, we see the reflection from the Hovatek that referred to the life raft. And then we see this other white light in the water. And this was where three of them were in their survival suits. So once we launched our FRC, we proceeded over to, the, like I say, we retrieved them in the water. The rescue took about 35 minutes, and the men say they're grateful to the Marine Atlantic's captain and its crew. Thank you very much, yes. and I highly recommend you. <laughs> <laughs> the men say they will be back on the water as soon as they get another boat. Gary Mansfield, CBC News, North Sydney. Uh, you got enough red meat in your normal life. <laughs> You've got the bones of politicians to chew on. <laughs> Coming up, our CBC Radio colleagues go to the range for target practice with Windsor Lake candidate Chess Crosby.
Buddy Wass's name and the other fellers are coming to the big screen. The CBCNL documentary, Still Some More to Go, is playing at your local arts and culture center. See all the belly laughs and heartfelt moments that make this band and their story so special. After the movie, stick around for a live question and answer session and deleted scenes. This show is in support of CBC Feed NL, so check the website for dates and get your tickets now. Brought to you by CBC NL and the Arts and Culture Centers of Newfoundland and Labrador. There's little more than a week to go before the Windsor Lake by-election and for two of the candidates it's shaping up to be a close race. A poll released today puts Liberal Paul Antle slightly ahead of PC Chess Crosby. MQO Research telephoned 300 people in the last two days and found that Antle has 41% of decided voters. That leaves Crosby with 37% and NDP candidate Carrie Neal with 22%. While Antle has an edge, the polling company says given the margin of error, he and Crosby are actually considered to be tied. Voting day is next Thursday. So the hosts of CBC's rate, CBC Radio's St. John's Morning Show wanted to learn more about all three candidates. So Chrissy Holmes and Fred Hutton are getting personal. Tonight, the duo join PC leader and candidate Chess Crosby. He's a lawyer, party leader, and an outdoorsman. They met up with Crosby at the St. John's Rod and Gun Club, and here's how it went. So I enjoy coming out here to, uh, to shoot because if you're hunting, for one thing, you need to be able to hit the target, right? You want to do it humanely and put the bullet where uh, the animal is going to die quickly and humanely. So you need to be able to uh, hit the point that you're aiming at. Right. How long have you been hunting? Uh, about 20 years now. So I came to it uh, relatively late in life. I was around 50 by the time I uh, went on my first moose hunt. For some reason, uh, people like you don't believe I'm a moose hunter. <laughs> Maybe I seem too, I don't know, intellectual or something. I'm wondering if that uh, primal beast in me, if I'm in my 50s now, <laughs> will be awakened when I do this. Uh, you get enough red meat in your normal life. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the bones of politicians to chew on. <laughs> so these are 300 Winchester short magnum bullets. So that, that, that'll do the job. Oh, that'll do the job. Okay. How'd you do? So let's have a look through the scope. Uh, two of my bullets uh, are within an inch of each other, and one is a bit of a fly bullet down at around uh, 7 o'clock on the target. But it suggests to me that there's nothing radically off about, you know, the sighting. You're a pretty straight shooter, then? A straight shooter, that's a good term. Uh, I like to level with people and not sugarcoat the truth. Uh, but it's a fine art in politics because, uh, you, you know, people are people, and uh, sometimes you can you can tell the truth in an indirect way. All right, all right, Fred, you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> Do I have a choice? <laughs> That's actually very good placement. All right, I got to try this again. Here we go. So that's not bad, and if it was a moose, it would be dead. I'm about to shoot a gun with chest crossbow. Are you ready now? I think so. And you're live. I'm kind of nervous. You'll do fine. Well done. I find it hard to see the objection to hunting if you use the animal as people do, like a moose is, uh, is food and it's part of the great continuum of life. Unfortunately, in our urban areas like Toronto and other places in Canada, people have lost uh, touch with that continuum, you know. Um, they, what they know about meat is it comes in cellophane. Our meat came from Sobeys or Dominion <laughs> in a nice, neat plastic package. been in Quebec and other parts of Canada, but this, this place just absolutely takes the cake. 
This day is down in history as one that everyone remembers where they were, especially those who had no idea where they were. Up next, a look back at that time when the world came knocking on the doors of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today is a fall planting day and it turns out having a dog who likes to dig in the dirt is actually good for something. Tulip. Okay Tulip, that's good. Thank you. Thank you Tulip. <laughs> and there we go. He's pretty helpful. Yes. That was uh, that was my Sunday. Tulip actually dug ten holes for me that day, but it wasn't all good. It wasn't all good because she did steal my my gardening glove as soon as I looked away, and then she buried it. Shocking. But anyways, I posted that on Twitter. I just wanted to to show it that. I bet you got more likes than anything I've ever posted on Twitter combined. Just saying. Oh, cute dog, you know. <laughs> Can't go wrong. But uh, yeah, she's she's my gardening assistant now. Anyways, uh, today was a good gardening day, but tomorrow, uh, not so much. We do have a system uh, coming through that's going to bring lots of rain uh, to the island, but some would say some much needed rain, particularly the gardeners and the farmers, because not a whole lot of rain lately. So there's that system making its way towards us. But before we get to that, we cannot uh, forget the biggest weather uh, story in the world really right now. So this is Hurricane Florence at the moment and of course it is heading towards uh, the Carolinas. A uh, really big story about a million people evacuated. So very serious situation. Category 4 hurricane right now going to make a uh, landfall you can see uh, like Thursday afternoon Friday. So it's going to be a really really big story a really serious situation. So just wanted to make a note of that before we get back to our neck of the woods and uh, so yes we do have a special weather statement in effect 20 to 40 millimeters of rain expected uh, tonight through to tomorrow afternoon and evening time so these are the areas affected uh, Green Bay White Bay most of the west coast south coast and the Avalon Peninsula so lots of heavy rainfall central areas will also see some rain but just not quite so much and here's the system tomorrow morning is when the rain uh, should start here we are 5 a.m. that's when the west coast is going to start to see some of the rain pushing 
through uh, to the eastern areas throughout the day. Uh, central will see some rain uh, 12 o'clock tomorrow. So that's when the heaviest rain will hit and uh, the Avalon as well later in the afternoon and into the evening hours. So this is what we're looking at. St. John's not going to see quite so much uh, five to 10 millimeters expected there, but you could see some heavy downpours and that's where things can get a bit dangerous. If you're out on the road driving on the road, there could be a risk of hydroplaning. So you want to keep an eye out for that, especially if you're in the, the Marystown area, Harbor Breton looking at 20 to 40 millimeters of rain throughout the day tomorrow. Uh, the West Coast looking at 10 to 20 millimeters on top of the other 10 to 20 millimeters that they will be getting the evening before. And uh, yeah, so lots and lots of rain there for Labrador. Great day coming uh, tomorrow. A summer's day for most areas. 24 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay, 21 in Lab City and lots of sunshine to enjoy. So Wednesday evening, the Avalon will still be feeling the effects of that rain. Another 5 to 10 millimeters expected there, but thing, then things clear off for Thursday and then the island is back to summer. We have 20 degrees as the high in the east with a mix of sun and cloud. Sun and cloud for central, 25 degrees there, not too bad, and 21 on the west coast and for Labrador, mostly cloudy day coming on Thursday, 22 degrees in the east. So as we head in to Friday, you can see some rain for Labrador, but still fairly clear on the island. So cloudy mostly for the east. Temperatures taking a dive with a switch to a northeasterly wind. 13 degrees as the high on Friday, but that won't stay that way for very long. Don't you worry. Uh, west Coast and Central looking at much nicer temperatures on Friday and a chance of showers for a Labrador. So this is what I mean. We may see 13 on Friday, but then Saturday is looking like a nice boost up to 21 degrees. Not too bad on Sunday either with uh, 17 degrees and some showers. Similar story playing out 25 degrees for central areas on Saturday forecasted at the moment and some showers there as well. Clear on Saturday and Sunday for the West Coast and some nice temperatures to enjoy. For Labrador, though, things take a bit of a turn uh, with lots of rain uh, coming through and temperatures dipping down to the mid teens. For uh, Western Labrador, a similar story 21 on Friday, 17, but then we're looking at 12 degrees on Sunday with some cloud. That's your forecast. Jeremy, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. On September 11, 2001, a man from Newfoundland and Labrador was in one of the World Trade Center's towers when the first plane hit. In 2006, Barry Powers sat down with the CBC to tell his harrowing tale as he left the building. Here's a little bit of what he had to say about a day he'll never forget. I, I remember exactly what it felt like when it hit. I mean, it was, um, I was down on the base of one of the stairwells. And, you know, of course, there was people all up on the stairs. And when, when, when the, the crash happened, I mean, these people on the stairs, I mean, you just automatically turtled. And these people on the stairs basically just were jolted and airborne for like a split second. And then it was just like, you know, just settling. And the building just, I remember just the building was just, uh, just moving. It was just oscillating, just vibrating. And... Um, I mean, it was the scariest feeling. Barry Powers' complete interview online. I think that story is about 16 minutes. It's on CBCNL's YouTube page. Now, while a lot of the talk about this province and 9-11 is centered on Gander, other parts of Newfoundland and Labrador also helped out. From St. John's to Happy Valley Goose Bay and Stephenville, people opened up their hearts, their homes, and hospitality during uncertain and frightening times. Now here are some excerpts from reports from the CBC's Jane 80 in St. John's, Tony Dawson in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and Doug Greer in Stephenville. They haven't told us, but we're going on this bus. You're going on a bus? Right. Where they would sleep last night wasn't the biggest unknown for Tony and Newt Rudder of North Carolina. They spent hours in the air and hours sitting on a runway, and they still didn't know exactly what happened in their country. I'm angry. I'm shocked, right? We, we don't, we don't, we just, we just, what we've heard. I mean, and we don't even know how much of that is true. They were two of 4,000 confused passengers to land in St. John's. The city's emergency response plan was put to the test. Have you ever had to deal with anything of this magnitude? Absolutely not. You guys are all getting a place to sleep tonight. That's Thank good news. You. Thank you. Something to be thankful for after a day filled with terror. <laughs> 
It was just afternoon when the first of five large jets touched down in Goose Bay. For hours, 800 passengers sat waiting. Finally, about five o'clock, they started off the planes. Then we may have to change. 10 o'clock this morning, the briefing at the military control center. Here, the problems are identified and dealt with. British, Dutch, German, Italian, the Canadian base commander, and the RCMP. We're getting through it, and everybody seems to be happy and uh, very pleased with the services that uh, Canada is providing here. Many still huddle around the TV, still in shock at why they're here, yet they're comforted by the treatment they're getting. Beautiful, fantastic. Fantastic. God bless them. Just down the road at the Royal Air Force Club, an American Airlines flight is being hosted, mostly by Royal Air Force wives. The girls who work in here, we set everything up in here, and then some of the other ladies just did um, blankets and towels, put them all in the rooms, made the beds up for them downstairs and everything. So, No second thoughts? No, not at all. Not at all. The weather wasn't great. But the Stephenville Airport still managed to give safe haven to planes from three countries. The word came down early to Cyril Organ at the College of the North Atlantic. They're told to expect possibly two to three thousand people. As it turned out, 1,100 showed up. All ages, all hungry, all concerned. Like it's not really so much of a concern for how we feel at the moment. You know, our concern is more for. Uh, how people feel in the states. Still, they had to be fed. We're here for a long haul today. Matthew Durnford is a student at the college's chef school. Already today, he's helped make 400 muffins. My hour tired feet and, and uh, a few hours of sleep don't mean a thing compared to what people got to face. Sometimes we've been surrounded by volunteers, so. We even, we're traveling with the dog and people have gone out of their way to make sure even our dog is fed and watered and comfortable. The preparations are all part of the town's emergency plan. To be honest with you, I never expected to have to use it. And I hope we never have to use it again. Well, coming up next, the latest on the frightening hurricane barreling toward the east coast of the United States.
welcome back to Here and Now. Well, more than a million people along the U.S. US East Coast are under mandatory evacuation orders as Hurricane Florence moves in. The powerful storm is expected to make landfall late Thursday or early Friday. Lindsay Duncombe has more on the preparations for Florence. Traffic on this South Carolina highway is moving in one direction, away from the beach, out of danger. There's nothing about a house that's worth staying in and risking your life. My wife and kids are leaving town to go stay with family further in and uh, I'm up in the air but more than likely we'll head out. Upgraded to category four, there are concerns Hurricane Florence could get even stronger, potentially the most powerful storm to hit this area in decades. The waves and the wind this storm may bring is nothing like you've ever seen. Even if you've ridden out storms before, this one is different. Don't bet your life on riding out a monster. The message from officials, even inland, this storm will be destructive. Expect power outages. Prepare for the worst. We must be vigilant. We are in a, a very deadly and important game of chess with Hurricane Florence. And what we are doing, Team South Carolina doing, is doing is staying one step ahead. Store shelves are quickly emptying as people stock up on food and water at gas stations, lineups, and short supply. And there will be flooding. The president was briefed on the storm today. Donald Trump's message to the people of North Carolina, the federal government is with you. I think that uh, any amounts of money, whatever it takes, we're going to do. Uh, they're prepared, we're prepared, we're working very well in conjunction with the governors. You want to stop them? National Guard troops have been called up, and these search and rescue teams from California are on their way to help, preparing for the storm and what devastation could follow. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. An Alberta man is hopeful that an experimental program in the U.S. will help him walk again. The 20-year-old 20 20 was paralyzed in a trampoline accident last year. Now he's the youngest patient and only Canadian accepted into the program in Miami. And as he fights to make progress, his family is fighting for new rules around trampoline park safety in, Can in Canada. The CBC's Rafi Bujakanian has the story. Back, squeeze back, squeeze back, squeeze your head. A year and a half ago, performing basic physical exercises would not have been much of a challenge for Landon Smith. The athletic youth was performing a flip into a foam pit at a trampoline park near Edmonton. He says he hit concrete instead, broke his neck and lost the use of his legs. I was in the hospital bed three weeks after searching up what can I do to change my life. Smith is now placing his hopes on an experimental procedure at the University of Miami. In October, surgeons will remove what are known as Schwann cells from the back of his right leg. A few months later, they'll place them in his neck. The clinical trial is banking on new nerves growing, allowing him to eventually walk again. I think at this stage, it's, it's just um, an awesome opportunity to hopefully progress and speed up my recovery. The injury has changed the lives of Smith's loved ones as well. His mother, Brenda Smith, is now pushing for legislated safety regulations at trampoline parks. They currently voluntarily follow U.S. standards. Public safety is at risk. And anybody today going into these parks is taking their life in their own hands because it will happen and it can happen to you and your children. A BC man lost his life at a trampoline park earlier this year. And Health Canada says that between 2012 and 2016, more than 560 people have been injured at such facilities. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. The federal government is bringing back the Veterans Service Identification Card. This is something that veterans want. It is, it is tangible. It is in their hand. It is recognition. It is something that they can show their family and their friends and their comrades. It's something that what I'm saying to you could present at a store and get a discount perhaps. You know, as small as that may be, it's recognition. Any armed forces member honorably discharged is eligible to receive the card, which includes a photo. Minister of Veterans Affairs Seamus O'Regan says veterans have been asking for a way to maintain links to the military community. 
Oregon praised U.S. businesses that provide discounts to veterans and said he would like for Canadian businesses to do the same. There are nearly 650,000 veterans in Canada. Here's a look at today's video of the day I have not one, but two from the same area and the same person sent it in. Big on the sky. So you, you want to play the guessing game? Where's yeah, two? Yeah, any, any guesses? Give me a hint. I'll give me a hint. Uh, last night we had one from this same general area. Labrador West, Wabash. No. <laughs> Labrador, though. <laughs> I'll have more. Welcome back. A massive corn maze near Calgary is baffling local residents. A maze maze. And that's the whole point, according to the man who designed the popular challenge. I want it to be so easy that they're coming out in half an hour being like, okay. So I think that's the beauty of what we do is we make it a challenge every year. It's big, it's tall, and it's tough. Mark Muchka calls this year's maze the Superman version. It's four and a half kilometers of hidden trails with dozens of false leads and dead ends. It can take hours for people to find their way out. Look at that. Wow. Some try it at night with flashlights when it's dark and creepy just to make it harder. But apparently that's part of the fun. Now the farm has been doing this for 80 years. Wow. It's like a big labyrinth. Basically, that's what looks awesome. Good on them. For yeah. Doing this. Well, here's our viewer photo of the day. You can kind of see a shooting star. You can star, see a shooting star. I think, in, on the left, Up in the left hand corner. There. So, this is the other shot, and this was taken in Northwest River in Labrador. So, not Lab West. So, Northwest. about 535 <laughs> kilometers from where I guessed. Yeah. But, uh, beautiful, beautiful shots. Just love it. Uh, sent in by Starseeds was the name that was given. So uh, yeah, if you have Must a Must be a big Our Lady Peace fan. <laughs> yeah. If you have a photo you'd like to send in, uh, just email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. And as Casey Kasem always said, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> nice. That's a throwback. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. And speaking of throwbacks, we'll be thrown back at you tomorrow. All right, we'll see you then. Good night.